Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. So take your Bible. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. That's in the New Testament. And if you need a Bible, why don't you just raise your hand here and the ushers are going to come down the aisles with some Bibles. They'll be glad to let you borrow one. And if you need to keep it, it's our gift to you. So uh, you can just take that along. As you're turning there to Ephesians, um, I'll tell you a story. <clears throat> it comes from at least 20, maybe more than 20 years ago. When I was just out of seminary, I was in my mid-20s, full of myself, full of life, full of hair on the top of my head. <laughs> and um, the whole world sort of revolved around me. And I was an associate pastor at a large church up in the Woodlands. And <clears throat> I remember one day in particular, it was my day off, and one of the secretaries called and said, we need you to come up here today because you're the only person in town who, who's authorized to sign checks. I don't remember what it was exactly, but she said, we need you to come up here for a little while. And so I hung up and I said, okay, fine. And, and I was driving up and as I was driving, I felt my blood pressure just getting higher and I was getting frustrated and I was thinking to myself, why the nerve of them to call me on my day off? I mean, I'm so young and spiritual and I'm trying to practice Sabbath rest, you know, and, and why are you bothering me on my day? And, and the closer I drive, the, the, the madder I got. So I wheel in and park the car, get out of my car, storm in, walk in, pick up the pin, sign whatever they need me to sign turn on my heels, walk towards the door, slam the door, and as I was going out, yelled out for the whole world to hear there, this place stinks, but I didn't say the word stinks. I said a different S word. I went and got in my car and just wheeled out, and I saw in my rearview mirror as I headed off into the street, one or two of the distraught secretaries come running out. And within an hour, certainly two, I'd come to my senses and realized what a stupid, juvenile, immature, inappropriate outburst. You say, why do you tell that story? I'll tell you why I tell the story. Because we want to talk to you today about anger. It's that emotion that glides along in the subterranean of all of our souls just waiting for an opportunity to pop up, sort of like a beach ball that you're holding underwater, just waiting for an opportunity to come up. You've felt it before. You've felt it. Maybe you've felt it at work. Maybe an employee who you've said, I need you to do it this way, and they don't do it that way. You say, I need you to do it, and they don't do it that way. You say, Will you ever get it right? Maybe you felt it towards an employer, uh, you know, a boss or so who, who won't listen to you or won't let you finish your thoughts, and you just get frustrated but you've, I, you've certainly felt it in marriage towards your spouse. You've felt it towards your children. You've probably felt it for your children as well, particularly if, if your child has ever been uh, disadvantaged or, or picked on and, and are not treated fairly. And you feel this anger in behalf of, for your children. You, maybe you feel it with uh, a relative who shares a snide remark at a family reunion. Maybe you feel it just because a relative's a relative. And so all of us feel these, this feeling, this emotion of anger. And that's what I want to talk today about as we start in on this new series that we're calling Wisdom for Life. As we were outlining the series month ago, months ago, we uh, said, you know, there's just a, a lot of things that come along in a person's life who wants to follow after Christ. And these are the things that will tackle us. And um, the Bible has some very clear wisdom for us. The problem is many of us don't access God's wisdom. Or if we have mastered uh, the, the, the first step of, of realizing there is some wisdom in there and digging it out, we don't apply it. So we said, let's just spend a few weeks working on this. Now, let me just tell you why I think this is a real problem, this emotion particularly. I believe it's a real problem for any of us who call ourselves Christians, who say, I follow after Jesus Christ, because I believe that any number of skeptical non-believers 
use this emotion and point to this emotion in our lives as the chink in the armor by which they might very well fault us and say, he or she is a pure hypocrite. And perhaps rightly so. Because if we've named the name of Jesus Christ, if we've come into his kingdom, Christianity, if it's about anything, is about the transformation of a soul. That, that, the, that the very power of the risen Christ could come inside of us, indwell us, and, and sort of ooze out of us. It's, there should be some transformation that's going on there. And so... That's why I want to talk about it. Now, before we go to the passage in Ephesians, I just want to ask you this question and guide you through a thought for a moment, just a sort of a parenthetical comment here. If I weren't here saying, here's what we're going to study today in Ephesians, but you wanted to fish out some of the wisdom of God's word on this subject of anger, how would you do it? I mean, I, I know any number of people say, yeah, I want to study the Bible, but there's just like so much of it. And how do I know? What, what, where would I go? Well, let me tell you about a little tool that you probably have in the back of your Bible. If you have a, a study Bible, you certainly have it in the back. It's called a concordance. And a concordance is... A, a, a set of alphabetized words. It starts in A and goes through Z of, of key words, topics, subjects that the Bible mentions. And under each of those words, it will reference every verse in the Bible where that word pops up. So you can do an exhaustive study and see every single verse in the Bible that deals with the subject of anger or any subject for that matter, okay? So we took a picture just so you can kind of have an idea. Here's, here's uh, a picture of um, a concordance. So you get down in Exodus and you see the Pharaoh was angry at Moses and Moses was angry and it was a lot of anger. I thought about talking about that story today, but we're not using that one. In Psalm, God is gracious and slow to anger. Um, and then you go down here to Ephesians. That's the one that we're going to look at today. In Ephesians 4, 26. So keep in mind that concordance. And utilize that. It's there for you. All right. So Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 26. Now, before we uh, study any text, you always have to back up and try to understand what was the context. Because context is everything. If you read something out of context, it, you're, you're, you're putting some sort of incorrect meaning into it. Here was the context. Paul was writing to the Ephesian Christians saying, once you have Christ in you, you are a new self. You're a new person. You're a new creation in Christ. But then he's going to go on and he's going to say, but you want to know something that will absolutely mess up your new self? This is it. Ephesians 4, 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I want to make three observations about this passage and then an application at the end. Okay, the first observation I want to make if you're, if you're taking notes is this. The Bible says very clearly, anger is expected. Anger is expected. Now, you, you're not going to pick it up as well in the NIV translation that I just read out of as you would if you were reading the original language or if you were looking at a different translation like the ESV. Those, those uh, words that Paul used in the Greek are very direct. He's saying quite clearly, be angry, comma, and do not sin. Okay. So, so he, he's saying, do it. He's not saying, Christians, if you're really a Christian, you'll never get angry. He's not saying, or if you're a Christian and you get angry, just it better not be very much and don't let it happen too often. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's, he's saying, no, no, be angry, but just don't sin in your anger. Okay, so what, what does that mean? So if, if I thought it was like most of us tend to think anger is sinful, inherently sinful. No, the truth of the matter is it is our duty as a follower of Jesus Christ sometimes to be angry. For example, if you saw s s someone who was uh, being oppressed or abused 
or trafficked uh, along the way. And that didn't make you angry. Something's not right inside of you. How do we know this? We know this because the Bible tells us we human beings are created in God's image. And if you study through the concordance, like I was, if you just go through all the verses, you'll realize how many of the verses talk about the fact that God too gets angry. So you have one of two choices, logically. Either anger is all bad and it's all sinful, but God sometimes sort of gets an exception clause because he's God, so he can kind of do it. But no, that doesn't work. That leaves you option B, that there is a neutrality to anger that can go sinful, but does not necessarily have to go sinful. You see this in, in the life of Jesus, who we know did not sin, but whom the Bible says did get angry. Look at Mark chapter three, and you'll see the story of where there was this man who had the withered hand and he's wanting to be healed by Jesus and Jesus is wanting to step up and to heal him. But just as they're getting ready to do this, the Pharisees come up over the hills and those were the keepers of the law, very legalistic, always out to try to catch Jesus doing something wrong and, and find fault in his ministry. And they're spying out, you know, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to heal on the Sabbath? Because in Jewish law, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath and healing would be technically considered work. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at them and he was angry. Of course he was. But they were missing the whole point. And he reaches towards the man and he heals him. Okay. So <clears throat> Tim Keller gives us a good definition. If you're taking a note, here, here's a definition for you of anger. Tim Keller is a, is a well-known preacher uh, and, and author up in New York City. He says this, anger is energy aroused to defend something right or good. It's energy aroused to defend something right or good and or to attack something evil and unjust, okay? It's energy aroused to defend or protect something right, something good. And it's energy that will attack something that's wrong, that's evil, that's unjust. That's why it would be wrong if you're a follower of Christ not to be angry about some things that the Bible says clearly are wrong, that are unjust. So last uh, year, about a year ago, one of my boys was playing football. This was the younger one. He was six then, and he was playing football not too far from here, just up the road from here. And he was on a little flag football team where they pull the flags off and, and they don't do tackle. And, and so our, and we have co our coaches, Dylan Lucas, who is our pastor of um, adult ministry here at Faith Bridge. And he's a good coach and really helps the guys develop their skills. And, and he spreads the touchdowns around so everybody can have some, some sense of victory and an accomplishment. Well, anyhow, we're towards the end of the season and, and we were playing a game and one of the boys on the opposing side, he was huge. He just looked like they'd been feeding him steroids since he was three. And, and he comes uh, along and he tackles one of our guys. And I thought to myself, did he just tackle? I think this is flag. You're not supposed to tackle in this league. And then a minute later, uh, another play happens and we're on offense and they're on defense. And this guy comes up and, and again, he tackles one of our guys. And at this point, somebody on our sideline hollers out, hey, that kid's tackling. And I looked around to, to see who it was and r realized that it had come out of my mouth. And, <laughs> and then a few minutes later, my son, William, he, he gets the ball and he's, he's taken off for a run. And this guy comes towards him and he tackles him. And at this, this, this point, I am angry. I mean, I'm thinking this is an injustice. This is a violation of the rule. We're playing flag football. We're not playing tackle football, right? Now at this point, I should have just said, hey, could we have a little time out? Coaches meeting or kind of talk about this or I'm afraid that's not what I did. At that point, I hollered out. I said, hey, that kid's tackling. 
And <clears throat> you have to understand the coaches at this age, they're both out on the field and they're both the referees. So they're kind of coaching and refereeing at the same time. And the opposing coach, he looks at me and he says, would you let us deal with it? And I shot back at him and I said, well, then deal with it. About at this point, Coach Dylan comes trotting over to me <laughs> and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Ken, you need to cool it. Two reasons. Number one, th that kid is pulling flags. He's not trying to attack. He's just a big kid and his momentum is going to knock some of our guys over, but he's pulling flags. Okay. And two, the other reason you need to cool it is because you're the pastor. Okay. <laughs> and you're cap says faith bridge on the top. And all right. So that leads to the second thing that <clears throat> Paul tells us here in this passage. He says, be angry, but do not sin. Okay. That's the second thing. Be angry, but do not sin. It means therefore that this neutral emotion can go sinful, can't it? Uh -huh. There's a line that you can cross when now it's not a neutral emotion anymore. What began in its uncorrupted form as a protector of what is good or an attacker of what is evil or unjust has now turned altogether sinful. When is that line crossed? I'll tell you when it's crossed in most of our lives, okay? And this is the litmus test that you can apply to yourself. If you'll dig in, you'll find that most times when you're getting angry, it has everything to do with your ego your priorities, your schedule, your reputation, your agenda, your pride, your own personal interests. See, I'll apply it just in my own life right there in that scene right there. I, at first, I'm thinking this is an injustice. But in hindsight, I played it back and I thought, now, Werlein, would you have really been so upset if the tackler was on your team? Yeah, you probably look the other way. And say, I didn't see anything, Right. So it wasn't the injustice that was bothering me. The problem was it was about my side and my team and my little guy who I wanted to get to have a touchdown, you know? And, and this is where it became very uh, personal and where my expression of it wasn't handled appropriately. Incidentally, just since I've been transparent enough to tell you the story, let me alleviate your concerns. So at the end of the game, I went across the field and found the coach and said, hey, I want to make amends uh, with you. Apologize. I was out of hand there. And he was very gracious to me. And I would later find out he comes to church here. And so that was really <laughs> nice. And, um, but, you know, incidentally, uh, you know, the truth is, you might not be a pastor, but you're a Christian. If you follow Christ, you wear the name of Christ. And so the story can apply to you very much as well. You wear a cross around your neck. You have the little Christian fish on your bumper. You say, Jesus is my whatever on your bumper. And you you, you got to remember, yeah, if you're naming the name of Christ, that's 24-7. We never clock out as followers of Christ, do we? Right? Okay, so <clears throat> if you'll do this, you'll be embarrassed because you'll find out how often it's not really some injustice that's upsetting you or some evil. It's your agenda. It's your pride. It's your ego. It's your self-esteem. Self it's, it's all about you. Just the other day, I was uh, leaving from here in the office to go somewhere to, to a meeting that I had to get to, and I hadn't allowed enough time and, but I hadn't eaten lunch either. So I thought, well, I'll just wheel in here to the drive-thru and I'll just get something to eat. And I placed my order and I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I thought, this is supposed to be fast food. This is not fast food. This is slow food. And the longer I sit here, the, 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 I'm getting angry and I'm thinking, what are you people in there doing? Taking a siesta? And do, do I need to go in there and teach you how to run a restaurant? I never did it, but I think I could do it better than it's being done right now. You know, I, and, and, and we're ooching up ever so slowly and I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, and you can't get out because there's a curb. And, you, you. and so finally I get up and the, and the little gal opens up the window, probably a high school gal, and, and she opens the window up and says, sorry for the wait. It's my first day on the job, which melted my heart. 
And I said, you're doing great. Keep it up, honey. <laughs> but do the analysis with me. What was I angry about? Some injustice, some evil that was object? No, it was me. I hadn't allowed enough time. I'd gotten off too late. I tried to smush too many things in too, too few minutes. And I was concerned about my reputation and my image and I'm gonna go walking into this meeting late and that's gonna be embarrassing. And I have to say, well, I was just stopping at fast food and you shouldn't eat fast food anyhow, I know. But you know, and all this is going on through my head. It was all about me. And if you take the test yourself, you'll find how often your anger is about you as well. All right. So <clears throat> what do we do about it? Well, look back uh, at, at the text now. He goes on to say, be angry, but do not sin. And then in the rest of 26, he says, but do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That's significant. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So there's something synonymous about letting the sun go down on your anger and giving the devil a foothold. What's he saying? This is the third point. Deal with it appropriately and quickly. That's what Paul was telling us. He was saying, be angry, don't sin, deal with it quickly and deal with it appropriately. He's saying, this is urgent stuff. If you just let this sort of sit out there and you go to bed on it and one night and the next night and the next night and a week and a month and you just let this simmer and fester, and it, you're giving the devil a foothold right into your life. And you're a new self. Don't do it. You're a new self in Christ. Don't do it. Don't give him that foothold. So <clears throat> what do we do? We deal with it quickly. How do we do this? Well, you start by taking the, the test and saying, okay, what am I upset about? Do the analysis. What good thing, what noble thing, what right thing is being violated or, or what injustice is happening that, I'm, uh, that I need to attack you know, and, and, and transform? Most times you're going to realize it's about me. Sometimes it helps to have a brother or a sister that you can process it with. I can't number the times that I've walked down the hall to Pastor Dan's office or Brian's or Justin's office and shut the door and sat down and said, okay, let me just talk and tell you kind of here's what happened. Boom, 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 boom. And you tell me, what am I feeling? Just speak truth to me. And, and the key is that you have a brother or a sister in Christ who knows the word and who will speak truthfully to you, not just tell you what you want to hear. And what many times, well, really there's three outcomes. If you'll, if you'll do this, one of three things you'll find. The first thing you'll find it's just about you. What do you do then? You repent and just say, God, forgive me. I'm selfish. The world's revolving around me again. Forgive me. Think of the grace that he has shown you through Christ um, and move on. The, the second thing, uh, now this would be more substantive. This would be uh, when it's not going to be so superficial. Maybe uh, a friend has betrayed your trust or a co-worker has taken money that they should not have taken or a spouse has violated uh, the lines of marital sanctity. And you're angry. And, and this time, rightfully so. This, this isn't just super, it's just about me. No, no, there's something objectively wrong that's going on here. What then? Well, this is where we're gonna practice Matthew 5 and Matthew 18, both of which say you're gonna go to that person directly. Matthew 5 says, if you sense that they have something against you, you go ahead and take the initiative and say, hey, you know, I'm kind of sensing you got something's off here. When you, Matthew 18 has not to do with uh, that direction, but this direction. If you see somebody who is in sin or you have something against somebody else, you're going to go directly to them. Not to five other people, not to 10 other people, not to a newspaper. You're going to go to them and say, hey, we need to sit down. I need to have some time. We need to talk. When can we set that up? Because I need to shoot straight with you. I'm angry. Because the knowledge that I'm working with, the information that I am working with tells me X, Y, and Z is happening. And that is wrong. 
and that makes me angry. And we got to work this thing through. Now, what if, if it's substantive, but it's not something that one person can, can settle or, or, or solve? It's not that you have a problem with one person. For example, the problem, uh, a, a problem of racism or a problem of, of human trafficking. It's not like you can just go say to one person, let me tell you what the problem is, and they can fix it. This is a systemic societal uh, problem. What then? Well, then in that instance, you're going to band together with like-hearted brothers or sisters in Christ, and you're going to commit yourself to uh, spreading a message of truth, full of love, um, in a nonviolent manner. Now, I realize what I've just talked about here in the last two or three minutes could really be a whole other sermon or a whole other set of sermons, and so we don't have time to do that. So I'm going to um, bring it back just to, to get to the point that Paul was making, and that is you've got to deal with this. You've got to deal with it aggressively, appropriately, quickly. You cannot let this thing fester. Ideally, how quickly? Before the sun goes down. By the way, you know, there's two, the experts say there's two types of of people when it comes to anger. One is the uh, exploder and one is the repressor, right? Some of us blow up on the outside and do damage to other people and the damage can be bad. Jesus said in Matthew 5, oh, I'll tell you how bad it can be. You can murder somebody. You say, well, I would never murder anybody. Oh, I know you would never murder anybody, but here's the reality. You can murder their reputation. You can murder their self-esteem and you can just knock that out in two or three minutes. Bam. And so he says, no, 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 you, 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 being the exploder isn't going to be helpful. But then there's also the, the, the stuffer, the person who clams up on the inside. And this is destructive as well. It's destructive on your insides because it's going to find you having to spend thousands of dollars on antacids and psychotherapists. To, to deal with what's going on inside of you because you're stuffing it down in there. So why not? We just got to learn how to deal with this appropriately. And when we goof it up, go back and say, okay, I've got to learn from that. I've got to do better in the future. Like if possible before the sun goes down. One of the many things that I would give my wife credit for, Suzanne, because it was her idea, was when we got married, she said, I have a vision for our marriage. And I said, okay, what's the vision? She said, I have in mind that we will pray together every night before we go to bed. I said, that's a good vision. I like that vision. We should should do that. I'm thinking a week, two weeks, a month. But I asked her, how long you want to do this? She said, like forever. I'm like, whoa, that's a big commitment there. She said, well, yeah, I think we should just do that. I think we should just, I mean, you're a pastor, you know, should, should we put, like <laughs> pray? And I said, well, yeah, that's a good point. And, and so you say, why do you bring that up? I'll tell you why I bring it up. Because she gets the credit for it. She's really the one. And I bet we haven't missed a dozen nights in all of our years. And here's the benefit of it. It is really hard, if not impossible, to go to bed angry if you have to pray with that person before you turn the lights out. Because it feels totally disingenuous, phony, fake to, you know, say, well, let's pray now, Lord. You know, and, and going on as if nothing's, and we've got to finally look up at each other and say, let's just go ahead and we've got we to gotta get, get to some point of resolution or figure out when are we going to sit down and get to some point of resolution on this. Paul said, this is serious stuff. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. All right, so last thing. You're going to be angry. You should be angry. But don't sin. Deal with it quickly and appropriately. Appropriately. So, that, that leads to, to now the application. Okay, how do I do this? I, it all sounds good. I was reading an article just the other day in preparation for this message. And it was a rather good article. It was by a secular psychologist. And he was going on talking about the perils of stuffing it and the problem of expressing it. And then he gets to his final point. So you got to get rid of it. And I was like, great, tell me how. 
and eager to see what he was suggesting. And all his suggestions were really, they were good. He said sometimes people count, it, count to 10. They find it real helpful if you just count to 10 before you say anything. Breathe deeply. Uh, cool off. Try yoga. Take a walk. Work out. Take a run. Listen to calming music. I'm reading on and on. And he gets to the end of the list, and basically that's it. And he's like, so good luck. And I'm like... That cannot be the end of the article. I mean, I, all of those things are fine and good. And, but, you know, that, 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 this will help me to manage the emotion. But what am I going to do with it? How do I get to some resolution? There's got to be something more than this. There is something more than this. And this is where the good news of Christianity, the gospel of Jesus, is so transformational if you can really get, your, get it to drop down into the depths of your heart. The application for today is you've got to get to the gospel. The good news of Jesus. See, here's the problem with you and me. The world revolves around each of us. I, you're like I am. I know that. I mean, it's all, it's, it's all about me, right? And we all do that. And, and yet when we do that, we fail to consider the reality that from God's vantage point, he looks upon us all and says, you're all a mess. Even you who think you've got it all going, you're all a mess. You're selfish, you're sinful, you're greedy, you're lustful, you lie, you exaggerate. You're, da, 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 you're just, you're a mess. If that could really sink in, that'd really be the, the best thing for all of us when we're dealing with this subject of anger, to realize in God's sight, you and I are guilty. The Bible says all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages or the penalty of sin is death. We all deserve death. We all deserve punishment. But God, in his perfection and in his holiness and in his sinlessness, looking down upon us when he could have said, you all are a horrible mess. I don't know why I ever even bothered creating you when he could have slammed the door and said, I'm going to move over here to galaxy F and start a new world over here with some new people and see if they can get it right. He didn't do that. In fact, he said, no, I'm going to come into this world, this planet Earth, and I'm going to put Put on flesh and blood, the man Jesus. And I'm going to live the life of perfection that you could never live on your own. And I'm going to die the death of suffering that you deserve to die for your sins because you're all sinful, he says. And then I'm going to rise from the grave victorious, demonstrating to you the life that you will have if you associate with me, if you link yourself to me by faith. Now, once that begins to sink into your heart, it begins to melt your heart. See, here's, here's the reality. Unforgiving people tend to be people who just are unforgiven people. They just haven't ever experienced their own forgiveness because when you've really been forgiven, you become forgiving. When I started this morning, I told you the story of what I did that day when I was an associate pastor at the big church up in the woodlands. The next day, I was overcome with just embarrassment and remorse, and I went back and made amends to the secretaries and all. But the real person that I was most concerned about was the senior pastor, Dr. Rob. And I didn't really want to talk about it with him. And he'd been out of town. And so the next week he came back. And the first day, nothing was mentioned. The second day, nothing was mentioned. And the third day, nothing was mentioned. I thought, maybe we're just going to never mention it. That's fine with me. And, but then right before the weekend, he, he poked his head in my office and said, Ken, come down. I want to talk to you for just a minute. And I was like, oh. So I walked down and I sat down in his office. And he said, Ken, I've been thinking about a couple of things and I want to talk to you about, and, and they had nothing to do with what I, with what I thought we were going to talk about. And they had, so we solved this problem, we planned that, and, I was, and we were getting to the end of the meeting and I realized we're, we're kind of getting to the end. And I'm like, great, maybe we're not going to talk about this. And 
But at the end, right when I'm standing up, he said, oh, one more thing, Ken, one more thing. He said, go, go ahead and sit back down just for a minute. I said, okay. He said, Ken, I've heard all about your outburst of anger last week. I said, I know. I figured you had. I'm terribly sorry. I'm embarrassed. It was immature. It was inappropriate. I was tired. I was being self. It was just wrong. I'm sorry. It was just, it was, it was just bad. He said, yes, it was. He said, it was rude. And right at this point, when he could have lowered the boom on me, he pulled back. He said, but I've been thinking about it, Kim. I've been thinking about it all week. And I have two thoughts. He said, first of all, I don't think what you said really reflected your heart. He said, I think you really do like this place. I said, I do like this place. It doesn't reflect my heart. I love being a pastor. I love helping people. I love working here. I'm learning so many things. It's, it's, it does not reflect my heart. Again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He said, second thing. I've been thinking about it. And it's occurred to me, you know, Ken, all of us do some dumb things in life especially when we're young. And I've been thinking, we're just going to chalk this incident up as one of yours. And we're just going to put it behind us as if it never happened. And we're going to move forward and we're going to make sure it never happens again. How's that sound to you, he said. I tell you, I wanted to jump up and give him a big hug and a kiss on the cheek, but I didn't. I just said, thank you. He said, thanks for coming down. You can go now. Now, when I walked out of his office, is there any way, after having my heart touched by grace, by forgiveness, when I deserved a lot worse. Is there any way I could have walked out of the door and closed the door and told somebody else, by the way, this is a problem that you've been, and I'm not going to forget. There's no way. My heart was like a soft dish of butter that just came out of the microwave. I was soft. There, and, and here's the point. In that moment, when he showed me grace, when he showed me Mercy, I didn't deserve. There was no way I could have gone out and not done the same towards anybody else who had ever harmed me. And in the same way, even on a grander scale, friends, don't you realize that's what God has done for us? He's looked upon all of us. And when he could have lowered the boom on any of us and closed the book on any of us, he said, but I'm not going to. I'm going to show you grace because I love you. And because you'll never fix yourself, the only way you're going to experience healing is through me. I'm telling you, when your mind and when your heart begin to wrap themselves around this reality, you realize the relevance of the gospel, not just to get you off the runway of faith 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago when you went on a retreat and you said, I want to have Jesus because I want to go to heaven. You realize, oh, I got to live the gospel every single day. I'm still experiencing his grace today. And he says, that's right. Now I want you to go and live in the light of that reality as you deal with others, particularly when you're feeling angry. We thought it'd be most appropriate to come to the Lord's table today, to have communion as we finish the service. You'll remember that the night that Jesus was betrayed, <clears throat> he took the bread with his disciples and he gave them a symbol. He took the bread and he said, now this isn't just bread anymore. This represents my body. It's broken for you. And whenever you come together, you're going to remember what I did for you on the cross. And how could you not show grace to other people? 
And how could you not show forgiveness to other people? Look what I'm forgiving you of. And then he took the cup and he said, this is not just wine. This, is, this represents my blood, which is going to be shed on the cross for you for the forgiveness of your sins. He says, I want you to take it and I want you to drink it. And as you do, you're going to remember the grace that I've shown to you. In a few moments, the ushers will lead you forward and there's some stations at the front. You'll take a piece of the bread and their bread's already torn into the baskets and then you dip it into the cups. All the cups have grape juice. And you dip and then you partake. And if you need the gluten-free elements there on the very farthest right to my right, your left in both rooms, table, and you can go to the gluten-free elements there. The ushers will lead you in just a moment. And let me explain one other thing. Uh, sometimes people are new and they say, this is only my first time or second time here. And can I come? I mean, I'd like to come, but I don't want to do it if it's not right. And sure, you can come. If you love Jesus or today you've decided that you want to, you come. It's for you. There'll be some prayer partners up here that I'll ask to come forward in just a moment, not yet. And you say, what are the prayer partners for? They're there for you. If you'd like somebody to pray for you, you just go up, pull up to one of them and say, would you pray for me? You say, well, what would I have them pray about? Well, I'll, I can think of two things. Any number of you, you're carrying some deep, deep hurts and bitternesses and grudges. And I have a feeling this message maybe, hopefully, just got a little bit underneath you. And maybe you just need to say, would you pray for me? I've got to get to forgiveness for this person or that person or this situation. Would you just pray for me that my heart would grow soft? And maybe if you've only just only understood the gospel today, right now, as we've been talking, maybe you say, would you just pray for me? I want to, I want to trust Jesus into my heart right now. And that's, I need to experience forgiveness because if I could experience ultimate eternal forgiveness, then I think I could show grace in a more effective way towards others. Yes, you can. So you go and you just pull up to one of them and they'll be glad to pray for you. And then you can go back to your chairs and the band's uh, musicians will be out and they'll lead us and we'll sing and then we'll be dismissed together in just a few moments once everybody has come prayer partners, would you come forward right now in both rooms? And if uh, you're in the west room with the balcony, there's two prayer partners up in the balcony. So you can just, you don't even have to go all the way down the balcony, down to the front. You can just look for one of those two there in the balcony. You guys come on forward right now as I pray for us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for um, your grace. It is amazing all grace is amazing. We don't deserve it. If we deserved it, it wouldn't be so amazing. It would just be something we earned. But you've given it to us. In our sinfulness, you looked down upon us and you had mercy and you had love and you had forgiveness. And then you say, not only do I want to forgive you, I want to transform you. I want to climb inside of you and live inside of you with my Holy Spirit pulsating in your heart and in your mind and I want to create a new you full of me he says full of my spirit living inside of you and so Lord it really is quite an amazing thing when we ponder your grace and your love and your goodness to us thanks for the way that you moved towards us when we were in our lost, sinful, most rotten condition. You didn't pull away from us. You didn't slam the book closed on us. You moved towards us in love and said, I'll pay the price for your sin. I'll die on the cross for you. And once our hearts really begin to grab hold of that reality, it really does change everything. Lord, won't you help us as we come in these next few moments to, to, the, to your table and take the, the bread and the grape juice? Won't you meet with us just in this sacred moment and help us to experience, maybe for the first time, maybe anew, the reality of your goodness and your graciousness and your mercy to us so that we might go forth from here handling our anger towards others in light of that.
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought us the first part of Wisdom for Life. Hello, Pastor Ken. Hello. Hi, so today we talked about anger yes. um, and these answers to life's questions. And so we did have a question come in, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, absolute perfect sermon for my life, um, but this person wants to know, how do you really let go of anger for someone who has wronged you daily for years and years? Sure. Well, yeah, that's a very real problem, especially when there's been abuse uh, that's gone on and for years and years and, and, and this sort of thing. A couple of thoughts come to mind. First of all, I think we have to go back to the gospel again and again and again and not making light of the questioner's reality. I'm sure that there has been abuse and that it was real and it is painful. Um, so I'm not making light of that at all. But that said, here's the reality. All of us have sinned against others daily. And all of us have sinned against God um, daily. What does he do? He continues to pour out his grace upon us. And so even the instance where the, the uh, person goes up to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive? And he says, seven, because he's thinking, man, I'm swinging for the fence now. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. In other words, just ongoingly, you're just going to continue to forgive. Why? Because that, Jesus is saying, is what I'm doing for you. Um, I think of the story that comes from the life of Corey Tim Boom, who, uh, was of course persecuted during the World War II, got carted off to Auschwitz concentration camp along with her sister, I believe it was, and her father went to a different one and they were trying to protect the Jewish people mm -hmm. in their Christian home, in their hiding place in the, behind the, the secret wall that they had. And finally they were found out by the Gestapo and, and carted off to the concentration camps. and. Uh, and she, as I recall, her sister did not survive, but she survived and she came out and began speaking all around the world and became a very uh, well-known figure in the 70s, um, giving her Christian testimony for faith from those years of being in a concentration camp. One of the more memorable stories that she would write about was the one where she was speaking in some country and after she had talked all about Jesus and told her story and, and inspired the masses, people were standing in line to come up and shake her hand. And she wrote about how she caught out of the corner of her eye, she glimpsed a person who was waiting in line who she recognized as a guard who had you know, done unthinkable things in the concentration camp to her and her sister. And instantly she writes about how I was processing this person, but I was thinking, I don't want to shake his hand, you know. And yet he's getting closer and closer. And finally, um, it was his turn and he held out his hand. And she writes about how in that moment she said, Lord, I don't have the will to do it, but I'm going to just... Uh, put my trust in you and you give me the strength, you give me the grace to hold out my hand. And she says it was just like an electric pulse just came through her and she grabbed his hand and embraced it and he said, um, I worked at Auschwitz. And, you know, they, but she had love in her heart for him, notwithstanding all of the despicable things that he had been part of. It's so really quite a good story of, I think, in, uh, illustrating 
this 70 times seven um, and the reality that ultimately we're called to just continue to live out the gospel that we've experienced. No matter how hard it is. No matter how hard it is. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so in the same question too, if I'm the person who is on the receiving end of someone's anger, sure. someone's angry at me and yeah. demonstrating anger towards me, how, how do I handle that? Yeah. Well, right, because that's an awkward situation. Of course, uh, Matthew 5 says, if you sense that your brother or your sister have something against you, you go to them. And so I'd say start there and say, hey, sister, brother, let's sit down and have a chat. I am sensing something's not right here and I, I want to know what have I done wrong? What do I need to fix? Uh, have I hurt you? Uh, do I owe you an, an apology? Do I, you know, help me know what I don't know, what I'm not seeing. Um, now, he, and, and, and hopefully, Lord willing, that can lead to some sense of resolution and get some things out on the table and realize, you know, it was all a misunderstanding and it's all good and everything's happy again. Sometimes, though, that's not the outcome. Sometimes a person, they're, you may just have somebody who's just out to get you and they, they're going to be angry at you and they, maybe they envy something about you or what your life represents and it just, it's, they're not going to even come clean if, if and when you do talk with them and ask them forthrightly, could we get this ironed out? I think that's where uh, the passage, there's a passage in Romans um, chapter 12, starting in verse uh, 18, that I think is really good. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Um, well, what's it saying there? It's saying, hey, you know, as far as it depends on you, here's, here's the reality. In any relationship, it takes two to tango. And so your heart may be right, you may be clean and pure and um, transparent and forgiving and transparent, all those things. But if the other person isn't, then you, you, can't, you can't put them in a headlock. Mm -hmm. You can't make, can't them. make them. So as far as it depends uh, on you, um, you live at peace with everyone. And then you just have to trust God is going to break through and do something in his heart or her heart that's, um, that you can't bring about because it's his heart or her heart. Okay, so let's just say you're having a bad day. You're just tired and you think, I can't do this. I can't handle my anger. I don't feel like it. Um, can do not have the willpower to overcome my emotions yeah. that I'm feeling today. Right. How do I handle that? Well, well, probably two things right off. Let me just speak from my own experience. Here's how I handle it at this juncture. First of all, I try to make sure I'm not going to do anything irreversible. Get out in front of it. If that means walk off by yourself, close the door, go in the bathroom, <laughs> just go by yourself so that you can minimize the damage before it's done. Um, that's probably the first thing. And then the the second thing then is, I think it, it comes back to the gospel of what God has done for us in Jesus. That great verse that we looked at in Ephesians 4.32. Um, even as God has in Christ forgiven you, you're going to be kind and compassionate and tenderhearted to other people. So we have to go back and re-gospel our own hearts. And as we're sitting there in the bathroom or in our closet or in our study or our office. office and saying, I'm not going to go and just explode all over this person. We have to remember, okay, I'm a sinful person. I am a wicked person. God has shown me grace. He's shown me favor. How many times? Countless times. And he died on the cross for me so that I can have life 
And then he melts my heart and says, now with that melted heart, I want you to handle others. And so I think we have to realize it, it's more than a willpower thing. It's more than, okay, I'm just going to psych myself out and just, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to handle it this time. Well, you probably won't. None of us have that much willpower. That's where we have to have something transformational that's the reminder of the gospel touching us again and, and transforming us and softening our hearts before we do our interactions with somebody else. Great. Well, I heard many times today people coming up saying this issue really is big for me and this touched me. And so this Wisdom of Life series has many of those things in them. So enjoyed the one on anger today and look forward to next week as we start part, go to part two of Wisdom for Life. And so thank you for your questions and for joining us here at Postscript. We'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.